Welcome back. So, in my previous video, we went over a lot of the big ideas of smoothers, and I covered the bin smoother. So, you know, I, I, I uh, have not moved since that previous video, and we, we, we discussed the bin smoother, where the idea was, uh, I'm trying to approximate some true function and uh, the, bin, the idea of a bin smoother is we're just going to chop our um, domain, so the x's, uh, into bins. So I've decided to put a third in each. And then a bin smoother is simply the average of all the y values in the bin. And we said that you get a step function. The step function doesn't approximate the f that well. But... If I, if I could have a whole lot of bins, that would fix my problem. Because if I, you know, if I had a million data points and I could have a thousand bins, I, I would get a step function that would, that would hug this curve and, and ultimately converge if I, if I could have um, the number of bins getting very large. I want to just cover a few alternative approaches. So one extremely important approach is called uh, the running mean, or it has another uh, name called the nearest neighbor smoother. And this is an extremely important smoother uh, to know because a lot of, um, a lot of uh, I mean, this, this, this basic approach is followed in a lot of places, including recommender systems. So this, this could be kind of a short video where I'm gonna give you some intuition behind this. And I'm also going to uh, show you the kernel smoother. So let's just go back to this, um, this plot. And um, instead of having fixed bins, the idea of a nearest neighbor smoother is to have what I, what I like to call a moving bin. Okay? A moving bin, otherwise known as a neighborhood. And so let's say I wanted to estimate my function at some point. So let's just call that point x naught. So what, what I'd like to know is what is the estimate of my f at x? So what is f at x? So that's what I'm trying to estimate. So the whole idea here is uh, I'm going to form a bin around this. So let, let me use red since um, I, uh, I've got a lot of blue on this already. And so instead of having fixed bins that never, never change, I'm going to give myself a little window around this point. So here is a, a, a window that we're going to call the neighborhood. And the idea of, of a, um, a, of a, of a uh, running mean or a nearest neighbor uh, smoother would be average all the y values in the neighborhood, and that becomes your estimate. So if, if we look at this, we see, well, a lot of the points are above that f, a lot of the points are below, and on, a, on average, I hope I hit the f. And then I could move on to another x0, so instead of x0, maybe we call this x1, and I would do the same thing. I'd have a, a bin of the same width, and I would just average the points up there to get the f. So that is the whole idea of a nearest neighbor smoother. So let me get um, slightly formal on you here, and I want to define the nearest neighbor smoother. So, so remember, I made an assumption that x1 is less than x2 is less than all the way through xn. So, so these x's have been ordered. So the definition is this, the, the, the k nearest neighbor smoother is this, uh, f hat, so this is my prediction, and I'm, I'm going to put a little k here, so k is going to indicate the complexity of my smoother at x you know, uh, let's just say xi, so 
let me kind of sketch this out for us here. And I'm not going to give myself quite as many points just to make this really clear. So let's say I wanted to estimate, let's say that's x sub i. Um, this is going to be 1 over 2k plus 1 sum j equals um, i minus k to i plus k of y sub j. So if um, k is equal to 0, then what am I doing? My f hat 0 at xi is just f, is just going to be y sub i. So what am I doing? I'm going to take, you know, I'll, I'll just write in everything here. It's going to be 1 over 2 times 0 plus 1 times the sum of y sub i. Well, the sum of y sub i is just y sub i. So you can think of this as really just 1 over 1 times y sub i. So that's why um, the, the, uh, the k nearest neighbor is smoother. Having um, zero nearest neighbors is the way to think about this. This is you know, the number of nearest neighbors. So my function would look something like this. So for every point, I'm going to average zero nearest neighbors around it, and that's my estimate. Well, let's go see what happens if I have k equal to 1. So with k equal to 1, my function is going to be this. And it will be, if we, if we look at my notation, this is going to be 1 over 2 times 1 plus 1. And we're going to go, this, I'm going to write this out explicitly. So y i minus 1. So i minus 1 um, plus, okay, so they got that sum sign there, y sub i plus y sub i plus 1. So what is that visually? It's take these three points and compute the average of them vertically. So I think the average of those three points would be about here. So I'm going to write in, this is f hat. 1 at x sub i. So it's going to be the average of the heights of those three points. Let's go do um, one more example here. Let's take the, the two nearest neighbors. So f hat 2 at x sub i would be something like this. 1 over 2 times 2 plus 1 which, uh, and then we're going to have, well, y sub i minus 2 plus y sub i minus 1 plus y sub i plus y sub i plus 1 plus y sub i plus 2. So what is that denominator? This denominator is 5. So I'm just averaging those 5 points. Uh, I, I should mention, if you take two, plus, 2 times 1 plus 1, sorry about that, you get 3. All right, so what would be the, um, the, uh, the two nearest neighbor, to, you know, so two nearest neighbors on either side, we're going to average these five points right here. And so if I average those five points, I think I get a, a value about here. So this would be f hat 3 at x i. All right, so let's just, think a little bit about um, what happens when I let k go to very big. So I'm going to redraw this picture and I can give myself a few more points here. And so what I'd like to point out is if I let k equal very big, what do I get? Well, um, if I had, you know, 100 points on the right and 100 points on the left, this would be my function. So this is k equal to very big. And what does that remind you of? Well, that's the intercept model. Versus if I start letting k get very small, if I go down to k equal to 0, well, then I have something that looks like this. And this would be the k equal to 0, so I'm just... 
uh, drawing a wiggly line between all my points. I'm, uh, there's some little wiggles up there I missed, but you, you get the idea. And then hopefully I can pick some k, and I'm just going to write this k equals just right. That gives me um, this, this nice smooth curve in the middle. And so if we go back to what I said in my previous video, the um, here's my bias variance plot, this very famous bias variance plot. We've just found a way of controlling the complexity. This is k equal to big, and that's this function that's completely flat. It's just the intercept model. Uh, out here, I have k equal to zero, and that's too wiggly. And it, we, you know, this is like the Goldilocks problem. If you don't know the um, uh, Goldilocks and the three bears, you want the oatmeal to be just right. So Goldilocks comes into the bear's house, and um, you know, one uh, one bowl of oatmeal is too hot, one's too cold, and then one's just right, and she eats it all, and then does the same with with the beds and everything. So it's the Goldilocks problem. We want to find the, the value of k, the amount of smoothing that is just right. All right. Um, I'll just mention one more thing. Uh, what about a bin smoother? So what about a bin smoother? Well, the way we control the complexity of a bin smoother is with the, uh, with the number of bins. So if I have one bin, what do I get? This is what I get. This is the function when I have one bin. And so I've, um, my, my, my smoother is too rigid. And you know I could write out here one bin. Uh, alternatively, I could have n bins. So let's just go do this in orange, I guess. This would be n bins. Uh, uh, that's a bins, not bings. And if I have n bins, what happens? Well, then I, I, I follow every wiggle in the data, and, and, and it's, uh, it's not good. So again, uh, with bin smoothers, you need something that's just right. One more um, idea that I, I want to not really write formally, but just motivate a little bit, is something called a kernel smoother. So... Here's the, um, the basic idea of, of a kernel smoother. If we go back to this picture, what we've done is we've established a, a window around this. And um, for my nearest neighbor smoother, I've computed the straight average of the points in that window. So, Notice I'm giving the same amount of weight to, say, this point as I am to this point as I am to this point. So they, they get the exact same amount of weight. But is that smart? Um, you might say the points that are closer to this x ought to be getting more weight than the points that are further away. All right, so that's the basic idea of a kernel is we're still going to compute a, a, an average, but we're going to weight the points that are closer to the point you're trying to estimate more than the points that are further away. And so let's say I had a, a function. So one function that gets used is the normal curve. Okay, so the height of this normal curve is going to give me the weight values. Okay, so this point is going to get a lot of weight. This point is going to get much less weight. This point maybe gets a little bit more weight than this guy because a little bit closer. And then these points actually enter in the average, but not with much weight. So that's the whole idea of a, um, uh, of a kernel smoother. Now, what we should always do when we consider a new smoother is um, uh, try to understand how are we controlling the bias variance trade-off. So in this case, this normal curve would have a variance. So if I make my variance extremely big, sorry, well, let's, let's make it big, all right? So it would, with big sigma squared, maybe we need to draw another picture of this. Here's my x, here's the y, and here's, here's my data. So just give yourself a little bit of curvature. 
and let's say I'm trying to estimate my uh, my function at at this x. So this is my uh, my x sub i, if you will. So let's say I have a very big normal curve, big variance for my normal curve. So it looks something like this. This is actually this should be really close to zero. Maybe I'm going to make this my my uh, my y axis. All right. So this is sigma squared equals big. So basically, the, the, the normal curve almost looks flat. And so if I give equal weight to all my points, basically, not quite equal weight, I give a little bit more to the middle, I'm going to end up with this function. So this is, this is going to be the function when sigma squared is very big. All right, now let's consider the other alternative, which would be sigma squared almost zero. So if the variance of my normal curve is almost zero, the normal curve looks something like this. All right, so this is sigma squared. I'm going to write approximately zero. You can't have sigma squared exactly equal to zero, but if we make it very, very tiny, um, what that means is I'm going to give myself a, a t this x sub i a ton of weight. Everything else gets almost no weight. And so what happens then, you can almost guess, it's going to follow every wiggle. So this would be the function where sigma squared is approximately zero. And so if, if I go back to this, um, this bias variance trade-off, um, this is, with a kernel smoother, sigma squared equal to big. This would be sigma squared approximately zero. And so we've just discovered another way of controlling the bias variance trade-off. Um, one more observation. Uh, when I go back to my, um, my bin smoother, not, not, not the bin smoother, the nearest neighbor smoother, what I want you to notice is that as my um, as the number of nearest neighbors increases, the number of points that I'm averaging gets bigger. And so we know that the more points that we average, um, the lower the variance of my estimator. Okay, so remember, you know, the, the variance of a sample mean is sigma squared over n. And so the bigger that n is, the lower the variance. And so the more points that I have here, the, um, the more um, uh, reliable my estimator is going to be because the variance is going to be small. Um, and, and so what, 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 we're, what we're seeing is the bias variance trade-off. When I have um, n very um, uh, small, the variance is, 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 is low, but we end up with something that, that has a lot of bias. Where the bias comes from is I'm including points uh, in my estimate that are very far away, and, and that's going to increase the bias of my function. Right? So, so you know, if, if it's kind of, if I'm including a bunch of points down here, that's going to bias my estimator. Um, versus just taking points close by. So the bias is going to be large, but the variance is going to be very small. Now, what happens when I, um, when I, when I reduce the number of points that I'm averaging, the variance explodes, but my bias becomes very, very small. All right, so what we're re really trying to do is, is make a trade-off between having few observations, which gives me high variance but low bias versus having a lot of observations where my variance becomes very small but unfortunately I, I have a, a, a bias problem. Okay, so that's the uh, fundamental issue that we deal with with these smoothers. So in the next video we're going to come back and uh, look at some different ways of having a very flexible functional form. We'll see you then.